we thought it sounded satanic. Of course we did. Um, so the perception of the energy uh, when you are, of course, uh, uh, in, in an environment, uh, actors uh, take on the spirits. At times, they actually, uh, you know, both in the Stanislavski method and the Chekhov method, but you are taking in and absorbing everything. Uh, do you think uh, that uh, some of the actors were actually channeling some demonic? You know, I'm gonna, I'll probably be the big wet blanket that will disappoint people, but no, I didn't. I mean, most of us were just, you know, we were just kind of getting on with it, doing what we were told. Um, and when the camera cut, we were all like, robe please, you know, wanting to get covered up again. And um, then you had the... So, you, know, you know, and honestly, I mean, we said, you know, some of the other girls and I, we'd talk about it. We'd say, you know, what do you think this is? It's like, well, you know, seems pretty bizarre, like this ritual, but we had no idea. So, you know, we talked and joked and laughed and it was a film and we were working and that was that. Honestly, that that's, you know, we, we thought that the atmosphere was creepy, but we were thinking, hey, you know, it's a Kubrick film. We're just... We're working, we're making money, and it's all good. Um, I mean, for me, I, I I actually did have difficulty with the nudity. I mean, I felt um, I felt very vulnerable during that film. That was it was actually difficult for me shooting um, emotionally shooting that film. I I in fact, when we finished, um, I got sick. I I I actually had a bit of a flu and then a cough and I had a cough for eight months. Um, and I, I was you actually had a cough for eight months. Yes. And at one point I was so ill. I just, I had no energy. I had just, I mean, it was difficult for me to even put my makeup on in the morning. You know, I had no energy. And then my husband and I, we decided to go to Hawaii for two weeks and somehow it was, you know, getting out of London, getting into nature and, you know, lying in the sea that, I mean, it was gone within five days. My cough was, everything was gone. I was fine. But um, yeah, I, I got, I was, I was very ill after, after that film. Yeah. And how was Kubrick during the film? Was he okay physically? Um, Did he I mean, look sick? Stanley, Stanley and I, you know, we, we chatted a lot. Um, he, I didn't ask about the content of the film um, and he didn't tell me and I didn't feel that I could ask because I knew that I was not allowed to see the whole script. Leon made it very, very clear um, that the script was ultra, ultra um, secret. Um, and in fact, I mean, at one point I even asked Tom because Tom and I were really chatty too. And I said, so Tom, what kind of doctor are you in this thing? <laughs> and he said, oh, you'll have to see the movie. I'm like, really? Really? You're not even going to tell me if you're what, an internist or a gynecologist? Give me a break, you know. But he didn't. So the the film was very secretive. But Stanley and I, we got along great. We, we chatted all the time. And, you know, the only time that we had any kind of um, – conflict, I guess, and it wasn't really direct with Stanley so much, was when Stanley wanted me to participate in the orgy aspect of the ritual scenes. Um, and I refused. And Stanley called me aside because I refused and I refused through Leon. And then Stanley called me aside at one point and he said, Julianne, he goes, please, won't you do these scenes? He said, you know, you've got the best body of all the girls. And he said, um, you know, I really would love your body to be featured because it's great. And, you know, it's very nice. Um, and he said, he said, you don't even have to be your character. You don't even have to be Mandy with the feather mask. You could be another character. And, and I just said to Stanley, I said, you know, and I'll explain to you why I, I said no. But and I, said, it Stanley, seems like I, I said, thank you for the compliments. I really appreciate that. I said, but it's not even that I won't do it. I said, so I it seems that secretly then Kate Blanchett got involved. Yeah. So, yeah. So she, well, see, okay. 
<laughs> there's a number of things that happen. Let me start by saying before we, way before we started filming, um, Stanley wanted me to be involved in these scenes that he said. In fact, I will quote to you exactly what he said to me. He said, look, he goes, I want you to be involved in these scenes where um, it's sort of like um, a dance, um, but with um, like a, with kind of a sensual, like a very sensual dance with some, you know, sexual undertones, right? And he said to me, he, he, as he said that, he said, there will be none of this. Mm, mm, That's mm. what he said. <laughs> I mean, he did that. He said, you know, we just want you to be involved in this. It, it's like a dance, but a sensual dance with sexual undertones, but there will be none of this. That's exactly what he said. And so Leon convinced me to go to these rehearsals. So they had the 12 girls and um, a handful of guys. We were all models. We were all fashion models. Okay. So we weren't porn stars or soft core stars. We were all fashion models. And we, this is in the summertime before we started filming those ritual, the, like the first ritual scene with the girls in the circle. It was before that, before all of that. And basically we had to go to this rehearsal space with the choreographer. And it was almost like a, like a dance class in a way, you know, you'd start off with doing exercises and then we would pair off into couples or, uh, or, you know, uh, three people. And she would say, okay, no, I just want you to kind of loosely dance around each other, but you know, in a very sensual way. And let me just preface that by saying, Right before I, I booked Eyes Wide Shut, not right before, maybe a year and a half before, I had been sexually assaulted on the street by a stranger and, and injured. I mean, he stalked me, pushed me down. I was concussed. I had the wind knocked out of me. I was nearly raped. And um, this, I was, happened, yeah, this happened in London. Yes, in London. Broad daylight. Uh, he was Arab. Um, they never caught the guy. And um, I, you know, I was, I was really affected by that. London for, was very violent. Long. London, I must confirm, was very violent. I mean, I was attacked in the street and I was broken my nose uh, just in front of a cash machine. Yeah. And I was assaulted a number of times. Yeah, I was mm. in Chelsea in broad daylight, you know, coming home from a catalog job. Mm. Anyway, so I, I felt going into Eyes Wide Shut, you know, I, I wanted to work with Stanley. So that's why I agreed to it, even though I knew, you know, I had to agree to full frontal and rear nudity, but hey, it was Stanley Kubrick, you know? So I, I agreed to it, um, but it was difficult for me because of that prior experience. So when Leon asked me, I went to the rehearsal, I did the dance, I, I danced with two other girls and we were dancing around all sensually with one another topless with a g-string and heels right as you see in the film and there were four or five models guys as well and you know they paired off in couples and so they did this I, I did one i did one rehearsal like this one one um session and after the session leon was outside he drove me back from the session to my flat and he said, so how was it? You know, thinking that I would be saying, oh yeah, it was fine, it was great, you know, we all had fun. And I said, you know, Leon, I just feel really uncomfortable. I said, even just dancing with other girls, and, I, and I'm straight, but I said, I just feel really, I just feel really vulnerable and really uncomfortable. And I, and I told him what had happened to me only about a year before. And I said, I just, I said, it's not that I, I wouldn't do it. I just, I just couldn't do it. I just feel so uncomfortable. You know, it just really, it just really rattles me. And he was disappointed and he told Stanley and then Stanley was the one that came back to me after he obviously relayed that information. And he said, Julian, won't you please do this? He said, you know, as I told you, you've got the best body. We really want you in these scenes, blah, blah, blah. And, and I, I just said, I, I just, I just can't, 
Stanley, I'm sorry, I just can't. How many people turned down Stanley Kubrick? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I, I turned down a few of the things that he asked me, but that was that was a big one. And um, so what they were doing on the off too. I do. I think it was pissed off. On the set, they were not mimicking sex. They were doing real sexual acts. Uh, no, they weren't. So it was simply an aesthetical problem for you. Yeah, but you know, I'm sure Leo, you've seen the full uncut version. There's one. There's one uh, moment where there's a girl that's kind of um, lying down on a kind of couch or a chaise. Yes, yes. And the naked man basically, you know, like slant banging into her, like full on, like slamming sex. Yes, uh... Um, and I know that because I had some of the other girls tell me what those scenes were like that actually did go ahead and do them. You were like, oh my God. <laughs> they said that that girl was actually sobbing underneath her mask. Yeah. Yeah. These are fashion models. I repeat, fashion yeah, models. No, I understand. I understand. Let, I me, let me explain to you now. I got to hand it to Stanley. And, you know, if you, if you put a producer's hat on or, or a director's hat on, I actually understand so much more now. Um, about about Stanley and about all producers and directors because the object is is singular. What is the best thing for the film? What is the film is number one and what is the best thing for that film? Everything else doesn't matter. What is the best thing for that film? How do I get to that place? Right. So what he did, which was very smart, he took all these gorgeous fashion models. He made them go once a week for months, months, once a week in these sessions, you know, doing your initial um, warm up and then dancing around with each other. Well, what happens? All of these people get to know each other really, really well. They're super comfortable with one another. Okay. So we're shooting the the ritual, you know, the bit with all of us in the circle. And obviously once all that, you know, once we paired off and we started walking upstairs and, you know, that was when obviously at a later date, they um, then filmed the orgy scenes and they filled the orgy scenes um, at a different location. We shot those ritual scenes um, at a, a stately home in Norfolk, but the the orgy scenes were shot somewhere else and, and in fact I don't even know where that is. I, I, I can't remember what the girls told me where they shot it. Hmm. But it was very interesting because towards the end of shooting those ritual scenes, it was Jan Harlan that came up to us at a, as a group, you know, all the girls and the one guy. And obviously they had other guys that had been, you know, rehearsing with all those girls, right? But the people that were on set at the time, we were just, you know, we were on a break. So Jan comes up and he starts talking to us. I don't like Jan. And he said, okay, so here's the deal. Now, initially we said to you that um, we were going to be. Um, well, let's, let, 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 me, let, me, let, me, let me understand. You didn't like him? I did not like Jan Harlan. No, no. Hmm. Jan Harlan <laughs> underestimated my, my intelligence. And I thought he was patronizing and insulting, okay. but that's me. Anyway, but with Kubrick, you didn't have this kind of problem. No, I, I, I like Stanley, but I mean, I think, you know, whatever, if you want to call it dirty work, <laughs> however, Stanley worked, I mean, the dirty work would be done through his other people, you know, okay. through Leon or through his yeah. first E or, you know what I mean? Or through Jan, okay. right? Because Stanley was lovely, right? But Stanley, and respect to him, um, Stanley had the film. The film was number one. What he wanted to achieve with that film, that was number one. And everything now, else was secondary. Now he okay? died. I actually understand that and respect that. Now he died and the film comes the out. What? He dies, of course, Kubrick. And the film comes out uh, after. No, he dies. So do you think that... Uh, he will have accepted all the compromises for the U.S. edition, the editing, the manipulation of his work. Yeah, I'm sure he would have because he understands that 
I mean, there's, it's a real dichotomy in America. Um, on one hand, a lot of America is a little bit more puritanical than Europeans. You know, Europeans are not as, um, they're not as funny about nudity um, as, as Americans are. Uh, but at the same time, America has such a massive porn industry. It's very strange. It's, it's this very sort of split personality that America has. So I'm sure he understood um, that that would have been necessary. And, and, and I'll go out on a limb and say he probably would have approved it in order to have more people see it. And honestly, the difference between the European version and the American version I mean, it's just a little bit more sex, isn't it? It's just a little bit more of those scenes where you've got people doing more things or seemingly doing more things. As far as what I heard, there were no girls that were actually having sex with other people in the scenes. I know people probably don't want to hear that, but that's the reality in that, you know, as I say, these girls are fashion models. Now, now uh, Tom Cruise is a top weirdo and a top Scientology uh, guy. Uh, we all know that he has all these rules. Uh, while he's on set, you can't, uh, at least in the last 20 years, the rules got more and more strict. Probably uh, in your days, they were not as strict. Now, no. Well, okay. Well, I'll, I mean, I, you know, I've said this a number of times. I love Tom. Um, Tom and I never spoke about Scientology. Um, I, I didn't want to broach that subject with him. And I wasn't interested in that subject and um, at the time. And um, I, I just didn't feel that it was appropriate to talk about those things with him. Um, so we talked about safe things, but we did talk about, we talked about things like censorship and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I, I thought Tom was fabulous and he was very personable. He was um, so friendly and so respectful to me and everybody. He was friendly to everybody and he didn't have these rules. I mean, I heard the same crap you did, like mm. something along the lines of when he was shooting Mission Impossible, he yeah. needed to have a tunnel filled from his room. But I, you know, honestly, I don't believe that. I don't because I worked with the guy for eight months. I, I didn't see that. I didn't see that aspect. I didn't. Okay. Thank you for clearing. He's much more down to earth than... than uh, than people might think. I mean, or at least what he showed to me. But again, I mean, there's obviously uh, room for error there because he's an actor. So he did, 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 you, did, you actually, no. did, did you actually see him again in the last 20 years, how he evolved since that film? No, I haven't. I haven't seen him again because, you know, he's... I didn't take the bait. I didn't... I wasn't willing to do whatever to get to a higher level you know absolutely absolutely I mean, i've i've I, you know and, and even i mean at least it, 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 i mean it, you know being conservative in hollywood geez with you know being a trump supporter i mean i might as well hang myself <laughs> i know exactly what you mean because uh, my wife uh, had friends who, who went instead and became the super hollywood stars i'm not gonna make names of stuff that compromises, of course, uh, uh, can be made along the way. And if you refuse them, you uh, you will no longer be put in that uh, position no? uh, of dominance in an industry which at times is made of compromises. Uh, now, you have come out as a conservative in a world which is dominated by uh, globalists, progressives, left-wingers. Uh, we are used to have renegades of Hollywood here uh, with us, uh, John knows that very well. We had uh, Roseanne Barr for a time uh, on a show with us. Uh, now, how uh, did your, uh, of course, uh, uh, stand as a conservative? Uh, uh, how was it received in Hollywood? Did you have uh, immediately, the, you were ostracized, you were fought, you were well, compromised, um, let's say. Well, let's see. <clears throat> I started becoming conservative after 9-11 in 2001, and I mostly kept my mouth shut for a long time. Um, I started coming out because I had a friend who actually was one of the first people to interview me after Eyes Wide Shut, a journalist from London. And he was one of the editors of Heat Street magazine. And he asked me if I wanted to do an article about 
revisiting Eyes Wide Shut. And that started my writing career. So I wrote that article. I then wrote an article about fame um, and the game of fame, because it is a game. Did you ever publish and, any books, Julian? Say again. Did you, did you ever publish any books? Um, I did. I did write a book. I co-wrote a book. But it's, uh, you know, um, yeah, I co-wrote a book about uh, long-term relationships and sex. Um, mm. But it's, yeah, I co-wrote it with someone who I no longer speak to. and But that's, I mean, that's not really... No, but we like to promote the literary yeah. work and we have guests and on there. I'm, so. I'm not, I mean, there is some truth to that book, but at the same time, I'm not that bothered about it. Um, but let me just tell you more about Please. my conservative road. So I started writing for Heat Street and I had these other ideas and then I would pose those ideas to this friend who was an editor of Heat Street and he said, yeah, go for it. And, and so I did. And, um, you know, I don't know, 20 articles later, um, I was really coming out. And then Heat Street closed. The main editor, who was a fan of my work, went over to Fox. I then pitched a number of stories to Fox, but the first story they, they wanted to print was my experiences in those months of writing those Heat Street, Heat Street articles and how people were starting to uh, react you know, how my entertainment friends were starting to react. So I did have, um, I had a number of people that, um, you know, ditched me, including my best friend at the time. Um, a lot of acquaintances, um, uh, you know, actors, directors, whoever that just, I mean, it was like, they, they just kind of scattered. Um, and I got a lot of insults. I even had some threats like, you know, um, we really hope you die soon kind of thing, you know? Yeah, it was not good. And then, you know, being called an effing C word and, you know, all that, that stuff, lots of it, lots and lots of it. And the Fox article, my God, I had thousands of fan mail um, and ma uh, letters of support from not just America, but all over the world. So that was fabulous. And that actually gave me a lot of strength. But at the same time, I also had thousands of comments online just completely derogatory disparaging you know just horrible comments it well, actually welcome to the world of the trolls of the internet yeah. Trolls. I mean. yeah and, and in fact i've gotten to the point now where um i mean i'm even more conservative now than i was three years ago um i've i'm i'm I have become way more conservative now. If I, if I look at where I was even in 2001, when I started to, I started to red pill, um, that trajectory, I've just been moving steadily to the right. That's interesting that you say red pill because actually Ken Reeves in that film, uh, in the Matrix, he shows a document in which uh, the, the, the expiry date is 9-11. So, I mean, it kind of fix with the red pill scheme that is then. Yeah, yeah. So it is, it's interesting because when, when you start to red pill, you know, you look at one aspect that you think, my gosh, that's not true. And then you think, all these other things that you've been thinking or that all your other you know views on how the world is and you think wow well if that's not true oh, that's not true either and, and that's not true and, and that's not true and that's not true and and it's it's actually really kind of scary at first when it happens to you because you feel like you're falling off a cliff you feel like you My don't have to though julian is that uh, in hollywood like probably uh, worldwide uh, where you are in certain uh, establishments uh, uh, connected to the entertainment industry uh, they might know certain things but they don't like to come out in the open and discuss them i know so many people that came to me oh i've read your book i don't want to even say who they are because they have prohibited me to to even yeah. have a photo with them yeah. or an autograph or anything uh, but they were readers of my book they had them next to them and then uh, when it comes down to though to, to 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 say ah i know leo zagami's work no they don't want to make that public because it's too dangerous there is uh, this sense uh, I know, of and I, you know and yes 
Yeah, I, I, I understand that. I, I mean, especially if somebody is solidly working, they've got, a, you know, a family and children to feed and, you know, bills to pay and, and um, it's their career. And I understand that. Mm -hmm. um, my career was always bigger in England. And so moving here, some might say that could that possibly was a mistake, but you know it is what because it is. You were you were also I saw in your uh, bio you have uh, acted in various uh, comedies, British uh, sitcoms, and so on, uh, which yeah. are quite known in Great Britain. So you could have actually yeah. hang out in Great Britain and probably lived a very comfortable life. There. I did. I had a very nice life in in. in in England, I did. I had a. What, what, what brought you to, to leave England? I mean, I left England. I remember it was at the end of 2002, beginning of 2003. That's when I left permanently long. What brought, okay. What brought me to, to leave England? It, there, were, there were multiple reasons. Um, one was I had, um, I'm also in music, and I had a, uh, a music manager that, to make a really long story short, promised me the world. So I. Um, and, and he was here and he said, you need to be here in LA. So second thing was I was really the, the, because I'm from LA originally, um, after, I don't know, 23 years in cold weather climates, mm. I just had enough. I mean, I, I, I think I have a seasonal affective disorder. And so just, I, I remember it was, saying, it was like me after a few years of living in Norway. Yeah. I just, I couldn't, I said to my husband, I said, you know, I don't think I can take one more winter. I just, I just can't do it. I can't take another winter. But there was another reason. Mm. Um, since around 1992, we've had in Europe and, um, and obviously in England, and you really see it in London, the steady influx of um, migration from the Middle East and, um, and, Sub-Saharan Africa. And um, so with that, you also had a tremendous um, increase in uh, Islam. Well, in uh, Julian, let me tell you that it got, uh, that it got even worse. Uh, I, I went back to London after 10 years. I hadn't been in London. Uh, with uh, my wife, we went to London, what was the first time? 2018, I think. And we went inside, this is an apartment from my aunt, it's an aunt, my aunt's apartment, she doesn't really live there, she rents or she gives it to family at times. It's right in the center of London, near, the, just next door to the Landmark Hotel. And as soon as, they, as, as, soon as they, Belgravia. Belgravia. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's also close to Edgeware Road though. So, I mean, you have that big- oh, uh, right, right. Right. Okay. Yes. Exactly. So what happens is, uh, I open the door, and the first thing that I see is uh, that the neighbor downstairs has a big sticker with written "Allah is great." The yeah. corner pub, the pub that used to be on the corner, is no longer a pub. It says "Allah meet." Uh, well, yeah. Were, oh, Edgware Road is terrible. I no, mean, no, but not Edgware only Edgware Road. It seems to have expanded further. From yeah. all towards uh, Baker Street. I mean, we are right in the center of London there, yeah. and and so it seems like really you are right uh, in 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 seeing and detecting that uh, uh, expansion, which has yeah. got even worse. In fact, oh, yeah. I yeah. went. Uh, I was uh, having a Masonic Lodge meeting uh, in London, and in my capacity, I stood up in front of the whole audience. Uh, it was actually the initiation of my wife. She decided to be initiated in Freemasonry in London. So uh, I, I was a, a guest at this initiation and I gave a speech because uh, I'm a Grand Master. I was also there in my capacity um, as a guest. And I said, uh, and it was in a church, the church of St. Edmunds in the middle of the city. And I turned around and I, I indicated the image of Jesus and I said, you are a bunch of fools. If you want to continue doing this kind of thing, you need to fight Islam now and, and back them off and, 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 and stop immediately this crazy expansion because there is going to be no Freemasonry or alternative thinking the moment in which you are not stopping this invasion. And, yep. uh, and they tried to stop me from finishing even the sentence. You know, Christy, they kind of got a little bit, my wife was a little bit upset because the, the worship of master was conducting the work kind of 
yeah. uh, nearly, nearly stopped uh, me by talking, which is actually uh, unprecedented because once you are giving a speech, you can't be uh, stopped. But I was uh, uh, not taking this rubbish. I said, you are ruining a country. And as I'm half British and I'm of royal blood, I tell you, we have been defending Christianity here and you are betraying Christianity. Yeah. So my stand was very critical. And uh, but but you're completely right, Julian. Please continue. Yep. It's it's very bad what has been happening, and we, I think the the pinnacle moment for my husband and I, and I and I've talked about this before, was during the. Um, do you remember the Danish cartoon incident? Ah, of course. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. It was during that time, and they had a protest, um, mm -hmm. and then they had a counter protest, and the counter protest was in front of the Danish embassy on, was it Sloan Avenue or Sloan Street? I always get those confused. Okay, so you were living in the Chelsea area, more or less. Yes, I was in Chelsea, yeah. So, you know, we just, we, so my husband and I decided to go to the Danish embassy to show consolidarity, you know, for the counter protest. So we thought, cause you know, we had seen the protest the week before and you had, you know, thousands of Islamists um, walking down the street with all sorts of signs saying, you know, kill the infidel, get ready for the new Holocaust, the, you know, all this, behead the infidel, all this stuff, you know, they're not getting caught. Or they're not getting stopped or arrested or whatever for saying all this. Um, but um, so anyway, so this counter protest was happening. Uh, we went to the Danish embassy in Knightsbridge. We show up and there's four people there, three people there. There was an older man who had served in the war, you know, with a Dane and he wanted to show solidarity. He was there with his grandson. There was another guy there who was 30 and I think one or two others, that was it. Wow. And meanwhile, across the street, um, there's a park on the other side of the road um, from, from the Danish embassy, if you know London. Across the street, there's a park and, you know, a quite a big walkway and there was about 150, 200 Muslims, all with those same signs sort of yelling and screaming, you know, Allahu Akbar and the whole thing. And one of the guys on, on our side, you know, held up a sign that said, you know, down with Islam or screw Islam or whatever. Guess who was arrested? <laughs> of course, the guy who criticizes Islam will be arrested. Yeah. And the cop actually said to the group, he said, you know, I don't know how long I can guarantee your safety, so I would recommend you guys leave. Yeah, unfortunately, yes, London and England is really lost to yeah. Islam. The problem being, uh, you see, it started really uh, gradually in the 70s. I remember when, uh, you see, I have been in London all my life. Uh, my mother was born there in Chelsea, in Fulham, there in the area which you described uh, she was brought up there and I started to go in London from a very early age. Probably the first time was when I was three months old. Uh, and the first thing I remember was uh, when I was growing up, I was uh, seeing all these uh, women wearing uh, these uh, yeah. traditional. And I was saying, but how is it possible that they're letting London be in both I up? Know. By, you know, and I then know. And then I understood. I understood. Have you seen the, the market? Sense. Have you seen the market on the Fulham Road in Fulham? Have you seen that outdoor market? Yeah, it's it's yeah. like welcome to Saudi. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, I mean, if you go to Edge Road, it's even worse. Edge Road is like beans. Oh, I know, I know. So, so the thing is that uh, I, I asked my mother, I was like, you know, they're going around like this uh, and, they, and you could see them in Selfridges or, and they were all kind of very respect because they were still a few, no? But they were buying London up. And then I understood. I understood the sense of guilt uh, that pervades the Brits and the Commonwealth and the fact that they have this big empire and now they feel guilty that they have to let them all back in. You and see, it's not just the British, though. It, it, I, I, I think all of Europe feels this collective guilt. No, 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 no. Listen, listen, Julian, I have a British mother. It is the British. And my mother is cousin to the Queen of England. So the epitome of Britishness. So I know exactly what these people have in their sick head. And their sick head is that they feel guilty. Oh, darling, but we went into India and were so bad to them. My, my great grandfather was uh, there uh, with the colon, uh, you know, in India, for example, with the 
the British military, for example. But I mean, the thing is that they have this sense of British guilt. Oh, darling, you see, we were bad with them, you know? So we have to make up for them. And, yeah. and we let them buy this thing and we let them do yeah. this. And so while I was watching all this, eh, I got more and more upset. Eh, and I still remember, I think it was approximately in 2002 after I was beaten up almost to death in the streets of London. I went and delivered the speech at the Theosophical Society and said, you are a bunch of fools. You're gonna, they're gonna bomb your underground. You, I know for sure they're gonna bomb your underground. And in fact, one of the underground stops that they bombed was actually the stop I used to use every day, which was Edge Road. So, I mean, and it happened a week after I was actually in London. That yeah, day. I was there, 7-7, seven, seven. I was there. Yes, I actually went for visit. And fortunately, I wasn't there on the day, but just a week before. But the thing is that uh, uh, the, the way that the Brits are, you see, they have this, uh, unfortunately, uh, this sense of guilt. The Muslims are a bunch of crooks. I mean, I'm not saying that because I don't know them. I have them in my blood. I'm half Sicilian. So I know exactly how, if the mafia was born in Sicily, it was because of their mafia, of the Muslim roots. Let's not forget that. When we, when we talk about mafia, we think, oh, Sicily. Oh, yes, because Sicily was for three centuries in the hands of, of uh, the Fatimidi, which was a, a Shiite group. So, I mean, I, I'm called Zagami. Zaham is from Iran, so I even have Iranian blood. I know exactly how these people think. And I, had to, uh, I was involved with Islamic people. And so I know exactly what they think. And I know that they think that the Europeans and the Brits are too naive to stop their invasion. That's the, that's right. the reason. That's the oh, reason. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Robinson, right? book, John, what kind that's of book? Bobby Robinson, John? John, what book is that? Then? That's the edition that Tommy Robinson's involved with. And what they've done, yeah. see, the way the, the Quran is structured normally, excuse me, my books are falling down. <laughs> we, we have, the, we have the the, John Bowie with a book is, falling on his head. Let's start. Okay, John. Sorry. The way the Quran is. During the quarantine, your beard and your head goes out of control. <laughs> okay, well, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. I love my mask in the car. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, normally uh, when you pick up a copy of the Quran, it's 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 listed according to a, a different order. It's not chronological, and what they have done in this particular version is chronologically organize the texts within the Quran. So you see the transition from the early period where he's going around and trying to convince people of of what he's talking about. And then it gets to where he makes the journey, and then he ends up marrying a Christian woman, a wealthy uh, merchant, and develops an army and starts using his sword as a means of convincing people. And so uh, it's, a, it's a distinct departure from, from uh, his earlier adventures. And keep in mind, though, so you, you think he was more spiritual in his uh, early upbringing, Mohammed? Well, that that could be that could be said, mm -hmm. and and uh, there are those that consider Islam to be a heretical sect of Christianity, essentially. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just. I think I think Islam is an imposter. I think it's evil. Well, okay. Uh, I but, think uh, I think it poses as something godly, and it's really the opposite. We will let John continue, but definitely yeah. the, the message that Mohammed had in that cave could have been given by a demon, not by an archangel. Yeah, it's, it could have been a gene. Yeah. Yes. And so consequently, uh, those forces that have not aligned themselves with the Christ impulse, shall we call it? Yes. Which is that God is love and uh, forgive them for they know not what they do at all of these various adages that get yeah. forgotten so often by Christians. But uh, if you study the history of Islam and you find that uh, the books weren't even uh, beginning to be available, the texts, the uh, Islamic texts until 200 years later. And uh, if you did, there's a, a video that does a survey 
of the earliest mosques. And you know in a mosque, the direction it points so that you bow towards Mecca is, yeah. is very key, right? But if you study the early mosques, uh, which can be done as never before with satellite technology, you'll find that all the earliest mosques all point and all, the, all of them converge. And uh, it converges uh, over the city of Petra. So that uh, the, the point is that uh, Mecca is not the real Mecca, that the real Mecca is the city of Petra. Hmm. Quite, I, I, I it, think it fits all the descriptions in the Quran, which Mecca has no uh, archeological sites that predate uh, the Islamic period. So that it's, it, it can't be called the mother of cities. It was, it was just a stop for caravans. I mean, it wasn't even a significant place. See, so there's a lot of difficulty in, in, in Islam studies when they're just starting to develop it over the last 30 years or so, uh, which is fascinating. That being said, I have friends that are of that conversion that are very nice, as everybody does. And not everybody participates in, in all aspects of, of their scripture, just as uh, I know if I went according to uh, Deuteronomy in the Old Testament, that would give yeah. me the right to own a Canadian. You know, so again, not everybody's implementing all the rules of their books of the laws, as we shall 